The presentation is the result of the work of the consortium. I was a former di director, still working, but not uh, as an official position because I am uh, now retired. And uh, this is funded by the CNRS, by uh, Genoscope and University of Strasbourg. Uh, it is a collaborative work, but this is mostly done by uh, the three people in my group in Strasbourg. But this is done also in collaboration with Bernard Dujon, Pasteur Institute, Claude Gaillardin, uh, AgroParisTech, and the uh, people from Genoscope, as Carlos said, a huge sequencing center. And the presentation of this day is uh, published two or three weeks ago in the last issue of uh, uh, the new uh, journal Gene Genome Genetics. And uh, you can uh, obtain this directly on the web. It's uh, free of charge for this. And uh, we will be back to uh, part of the data if you are interested. All the data are on the website with all the sequence analysis, etc. And uh, just to give you a general idea of our view about uh, science, our most important interest is eukaryotic genome evolution. But to do that, we have decided to work with yeast. Why yeast? Because the genome are a little bit small in comparison of other organisms. So it is very important to have small genome and to do the full sequence of the genome. This is very important. We need, if possible, because you have always mistake in any human work, but it is important to catch all the gene of a genome, what is possible. So. Uh, Yeast comparative genomic, and we will we are working on a special class of yeast, EMIAS Comiset. I will be back with uh, a basic classification. So uh, when we start this more than 10 years ago, we demonstrated that there is in each yeast you sequence new gene. This is a very important phenomenon. And we convince our government to give some money in order to do the sequence, the full sequence of the species. And with this full sequence of the species, we can have some new information. There is very huge difference between each lineage. And even if you have species that seems to belong to the same group, same clad is not very easy to make a definition of clad. And you have a huge difference. For example, I will discuss about Pichia sorbitophila. Here, people are working with Pichia spiripitis, but it's very, very, very different species. Even if you have the same genus name, Pichia. So take care. Gene names are very bad. They, they give you a bad information. And we have uh, defined some uh, things, and uh, we have uh, analyzed the effect of the whole genome duplication. So starting from, uh, for example, seven chromosomes and to move to 14 chromosomes, the so double of chromosomes, what happened after. And we have discussed the aspect of centromere. Sometimes you have very well-defined centromere in yeast. Sometimes you have no centromere. You destroy the centromere, and the centromere is able to be rebuilt anywhere in the genome. No transposable element or much transposable. Huge variation in Terena copy number. Minimum level to 10 times more. So it's very, very uh, changing from one yeast to another yeast. And uh, we, before going to Pichia sorbitophila, just few ideas about 
the fungi. So if we are looking to fungi, this is the classification as proposed by James et al. in 06. And we are working in this era. So we are looking in Ascomicota. If we are looking in Ascomicota, you have, basic, uh, you have this group with three main clays. Vesisomicota, Saccharomicotina, Tafranomicotina. And our work is on this group. If we are focusing on this group, you have at least three general uh, uh, big groups. One is the Saccharomyces group or Saccharomycetaceae. There is uh, some uh, classification, but the classification is changing each day. You have new names. You have, it's very confusing. So we, I don't want to discuss more of this thing. Just two things. You have two kinds of species. After a whole genome duplication, like Saccharomyces cerevisiae, Candida glabrata, or other species without duplication. You have a second group, the CTG group. The genetic code is not the same as the general genetic code. And you can see the CTG codons are translated in serine and not in leucine. This is in Candida albicans, Debariosmyces anseni, and Picia sorbitophila. Our uh, uh, yeast discuss this day. And one more thing, you see here Candida, you see here Candida. You have two Candida. One, there are two human pathogens, but they have absolutely no relation in the point of uh, genome organization. Two different, two different worlds. And you have a third group with uh, Yarovia lipolitica. And the, one of the characteristics of the group is to have a GC rich genome. And we, as I said previously, we would like to do comparative genotype in order to decipher some step in eukaryotic genome evolution. In a previous work, we were able to do some classification. Just uh, if you look at this, you have the same name I discussed previously. This is the chromosome number. And this is the size of the genome. After you have morphing, I don't want to discuss too much this. But yeah, as you can see, the size of the genome is around 13 megabytes, with few exceptions. In a second uh, work, we have uh, described the, the basic uh, rule for genome redundancy. Genome redundancy is uh, a general rule in all the genome, but what are the bases of uh, genome redundancy. And we have demonstrated that several aspects are uh, implied by this. Whole genome duplication that happen in all the genome, for example, in human, it was said there are at least three rules of uh, three uh, number of whole genome duplication. In paramecium, you have at least three, may probably four rules of whole genome duplication, but is only a small aspect for the creation of new paralogs. Uh, the dynamic of transposable element is very important. One point that seems essential to me is the conservation of synteny. When you have genome evolution, first thing, is point mutation or small deletion, small duplication within coding sequence. But the synteny, synteny means you have conservation of the genetic map. Synteny is very well conserved. It's the modification of genetic map is a second term in the evolution of the genome. First, you have amino acid replacement. This is the most important driving force for evolution in the first step. So now we are going to discuss what is the history of Picia sorbitophila. And it's a new species. I will try to convince you that we are facing 
the creation of a new species that happens probably two or three or four hundred years ago, very recently. And we have some argument for this. I will use several words present here. I would like to remember for young students that basic thing never forget when you are studying genomics is the genome coverage and the GC content. This is critical point. Due to yeast, generally, as said previously, the genome size for haploid, because as you know, when we discuss of genome size, is still a standardization to the haploid level. To the haploid level is around 30 megabits, few exception. And the number of chromosomes is rarely more than eight, except for the species that and uh, that, have, uh, that are the result of a whole genome duplication event. So, this is the yeast. Uh, a general question, why do you choose this yeast? Because you have thousands of yeast. Why this one or not this one? We were interested long time ago to the resistance to sal concentration. And here, you have Saccharomyces cerevisiae, other yeast, and you have the capability to grow in different media in presence of high concentration of salt. And you can see that Picia sorbitophila is highly resistant uh, to this salt. And in comparison, you have the level of concentration that is able to uh, optimize the growth of Saccharomyces cerevisiae. <coughs> Here you have the classification. Here this is uh, uh, Saccharomyces uh, group with point centromer. Here you have the group with the CTG uh, replacement for the genetic code and the GC rich uh, Species and Picia sorbitophila is here close to one species, Debaryomyces uh, anseni. Debaryomyces anseni that is present here. So the idea to see what is the genome of this species starts more than 15 years ago. At the time, it was not in our idea to study the genome evolution. So. This sequence was made using a whole technology. I say Sanger is an old technology because from five to six years, now you sequence with four, five, four, Illumina or applied. And recently you said, uh, you have seen in, pa in paper, even in newspaper, that you use a torrent technology. But torrent technology is for the resequencing. I discuss of the technology that are able to produce new genomes that are not known. So if we, uh, when we receive the, from the genoscope the sequence, we have, we have 17 scaffold. And immediately, we were looking at the genome coverage. And we observe we have two uh, kinds of uh, uh, scaffold. We have scaffold with a coverage of about seven to eight. And we observe that the identity between this scaffold was not 100%. And we have also six scaffold with about 14, 15, 16 genome coverage that were absolutely homozygous. So we postulate that it was uh, a special organization with the chromosome. We have 14 chromosomes. The six scaffold with this uh, double uh, genome coverage, 16 instead of eight, uh, represent homozygote region and could be split in three pairs of two chromosomes. And the other one are uh, chromosome with some heterozygote region. 
here you have the 14 chromosome, and the 14 chromosome could be paired by homology similarity like this. Here you have these two chromosomes that are fully homozygote. Here you have one pair of chromosomes with this is homozygote and this is heterozygote constitution, the same for here. Here you have fully heterozygote with one chromosome and other, the, this chromosome and chromosome are only identical by 80% of similarity in uh, nucleic acid. And in, for this chromosome, it was not possible to make pair, but we have some exchange and we have postulated immediately that there is, in the history of this species, or the species that it derived to Picas orbitophila, a reciprocal translocation that happened. So we have, a, the total size is this one, the haploid equivalent standardization is this one. So we immediately postulate that we have not a diploid species, but we have an, an hybrid between two yeast species, and these two yeast species are different. We have looked at the position, but when you have a, a new species, you would like to have some characteristic. And uh, for example, we were able to demonstrate that for each, we have the telomeric era here. So we were confident of the structure of the chromosome. We have accordance between the size of the sequence chromosome and the chromosome detected by pulse field gel electrophoresis in order to have the size. And uh, the, image, the second goal, when you have telomere, people are looking for centromere. We were able to describe the telomere. The telomere are totally different from that uh, we have seen previously, totally different from Saccharomyces cerevisiae, where the centromere is around 100 base pair with a very well uh, conservation of uh, sequence between related species. Uh, in this place, we have a very low JC content. You have no repeat sequence like uh, retrotransposon. Some very often, retrotransposon are at the basis of uh, the centromere. This is the case in a, a very, very distant uh, yeast, uh, Schizosecaromyces pombe, but is also the, uh, the composition of uh, uh, one uh, species, like the Barrios Myces anseni. Here, you have only a very low GC repeat. You have only one per chromosome, and when you have heterologous chromosome, you have exactly the concordance between this, uh, the position on one chromosome and the position on another chromosome. But I would like to say what we are doing is only by bioanalysis. So the main criticism, you have to prove by biochemical evidence that this is really a centromere. But we are confident that this is the place where the centromere are. Now, we have look at the divergence because I would like to be back here. You have seen this is homozygote, this is homozygote. Here, this is heterozygote with a point of translocation. Here, you have heterozygote and homozygote here. So, we have split the genome for analysis in IRA that are totally homozygote, and I say totally is not is uh, with mi minus different SNPs, and they are very important, and the other. If we are looking to the heterozygous region, we are able to see that there is big difference in del, in the insertion or deletion. And in the, if we are looking at the percentage of similarity, this is a big table, I don't want to bother you with this, we observe that there are at least around 11% of sequence divergent in centenic region on the heterozygous part of the genome. 
10% to 11% is the difference between two yeasts that are very different is Saccharomyces cerevisiae and Saccharomyces paradoxus. So we are confident with our hypothesis. We have a new species that result from the cross between two distant species with 11% difference in their genome. So the history, we have, this is Picia sorbitophila. So in the history, Picia sorbitophila, 300 or 400 years ago, we have an initial hybrid. The initial hybrid come from one parent and from another parent with a difference about 11%. And they derive from an hypothetical ancestor long, long, long time ago. So we are looking at the polymorphism, this part in homozygote region. So this means we have close to 100% of similarity, but we are looking for SNP. SNP are represented here. So we have made some calculation. And we are able to go to the conclusion. And we were also able to make, I don't want to discuss this part, we are able to calculate the number of generation from this initial hybrid formation until this point here. This is described in the paper I have uh, said previously, it was published uh, two weeks ago. And so if you can see that here, you have one SNP by 35, uh, for 35 AV, one SNP for uh, um, uh, megabase, uh, no, kilobase, and here one SNP for 20 megabase. So taking in good the number of SNP present in hetero, in homozygote region, we were able to postulate that 30% of the genome is homozygote. We have what is going to this homozygosy. Homozygosy is obtained by successive lot of heterozygosy. This is what we name LOH event. Formation of the hybrid were just before the first LOH, and we have calculated that the number of uh, uh, LOH, there are at least three rounds of LOH. This one, you have time, this is the most ancestor LOH that happened, and you have time to accumulate this number of SNP. And the most recent is this one, we have time to accumulate only 22 SNPs. So we have one hybrid, but we have not the parent. At the difference of people, and the basic thing in genetics, you have two parents, you cross, you obtain the hybrid, and you make some calculation, OK? And you make genetics all of them. Here is different. We have the hybrid, but we have no idea of the parent. And the challenge was to discover, if possible, the parent or the closely related parent. So to do that, we have uh, adopt one thing. First of all, the GC content, as I said previously, is very important. And we have observed in heterozygote part of the genome that the GC content is, uh, is able to do, to do some variation. So we focus on the heterozygote region. We look and we make the classification of genes with identical size. And we look at a specific position in each codon. So the specific position in each codon is the position three, where with the genetic code, it's possible to have the same amino acid, but a, di a different amino acid. A different, the same amino acid, but a different codon. So what we have done, 
you, uh, we have selected all the codons with two opportunities for the third, uh, I mean, uh, for the third position of the codon, a T or a C, and to see if there is some enrichment for the T or the C in one group of genes belonging to one parent and the group of genes belonging to other parent. So we have made the calculation for the homozygote reagent. We have made the calculation for the... Yep. Yes. We have made the calculation for homozygote region, the calculation for heterozygote region, and we were able to extract the, uh, uh, the organization of the genome. Here you have the parents, we name P gamma. P gamma high, uh, high GC content as calculated. Here you have an heterozygote, and you can see that all along the chromosome, we have for this chromosome a high GC content, for this one a low GC content. And for this one, we have here a high GC content after a low GC content, and after that, you have homozygosy. So we were able to say that is. P gamma parent represent in pink, give this chromosome here, and the other P epsilon parent give the blue part of the chromosome. We are able to discriminate what is the contribution of each parent to do the PKIA sorbitophila genome. So if you have a look at this, you said, okay, this is what you said by bioinformatics. But maybe it's wrong because this piece blue could be here and this red could be here. It's still possible. So we have checked by PCR and resequencing, and we have proved that the presentation of our genetic map are good, are totally in correlation with this, with this picture. This means that in addition to the evolution, during one time, there is a broken piece between these two pairs of chromosomes. There is an exchange. So we were happy to see that we were able to make the difference between this one and this one. But it will be interesting to have an ID of the parent, because you have a hybrid, but you don't know the parent. So in parallel, other people in the Genolovur uh, Consortium, one of them is Serge Casarigola, was working on the Milerosima group. Milerosima and Pikia is the same group, but uh, things are, the names are changing, and uh, this is bad, but uh, this is a part of the publication, of the evolution in publication. And we have sequenced the Milesorima group, one special strain, this one, CBS2001. And we observe that, with Serge Casarigola, that uh, the sequence made time to time in this specimen were 100% identical to the Pigama subgenome. And so we have decided to sequence more CDS in the Pikia farinosa genome, and the result is here. Here we have the, you have several uh, points or triangle. Here, when it is a black, you have 100% of similarity with farinosa, or 99%. And if you have a white tri triangle, this means you have less identity. As you can see, all the white are on the blue, that is the epsilon of unknown origin. All the uh, uh, black are on the red from CBS2001. So we, are, we have identified by chance one of the parents because one of the parents, or probably not the parent, but very, very similar to the parent, was present in the collection. 
So we were able to make some phylogenetic uh, position. We have described that the PKF sorbitol phyla genome one is here, P gamma, P epsilon is here. It's very related to the species uh, uh, Milerosima CBS2001. And we can say that they correspond to two different species as distant as uh, Saccharomyces cerevisiae and Saccharomyces paradoxus. And here you have Debaryomyces anseni. We have sequence that is almost identical in terms of synteny and only in terms of synteny with this species. Guillermondi was sequenced by another group, not fully sequenced, in par partially sequenced, but there is also a very good conservation of the synteny. However, the amino acid divergence is very, very important. So, we would like to go a little bit further. So, still the same scheme, hypothetical ancestor. We know now one of the parents. We don't know the parent, and we have not discovered the other parent. Sorry, but uh, we, we are not enough good. Okay? So, there is a hybrid. We, I have described the process of homozygotization by the loss of heterozygosy and the time that happened by using the SNP analysis. We look at the contribution of the different genes coming from this parent to this parent. We observe that all the mal gene, mal gene uh, are gene implicated in the metabolism of maltose. They all come from the, this parent, only this parent. We observe also that we have 220 parents specific. Some are coming from this one, some are coming from this one. These genes are specific of the Pikia sorbitophila present here, and pro they are present in this one or in this one, so they have been accurate from the hypothetical ancestor, but probably by horizontal gene acquisition. And they were introduced and they move in the genome time to time. Now, we have also looked at NUMS. NUMS are nuclear sequence of mitochondrial origin. Each time you have a double strong, oh no, I have to, to stay in front. Each time you have a double strong break in a chromosome, you have two ways, or the cell die, or the cell survive. In order to survive, the cell fills the gap with any piece of DNA. If it's a mitochondrial piece of DNA that is present, the cell picked this sequence and introduced in the chromosome. So in your body, in yeast, in everywhere, each time you have an organism with mitochondrial DNA, you have in the chromosome what we name NUMS. Piece, short piece, not a full gene, just few elements, just to restore the chromosomal integrity. It could be done also with other elements. But so we were looking at this, and we observed that the nuclear element from Prigama from only four, but there are 20 from the other uh, genome. So there is some disequilibrium. But, <coughs> and this is indicated here, we were able to, uh, to show that this piece of insertion were here, here, and here. Most of them are hemizygote. Hemizygote means on one pair of chromosomes, you have the presence of a NUMP here, but on the other pair, you have not the presence of this piece of DNA. This means that this introduction were made previously between the fusion of the two parents in order to give the hybrid. So, we were able also to see that the mitochondrial DNA 
by a similarity was coming from this parent and not from this parent. One interesting thing is I have speak until now from acquisition of gene. Gene coming from one parent, which coming from one parent. But the other part, what gene are loose? And if we look at different genes, we observe that the RDNA is at the hemizygote state. Only one parent contributes to the production of RDNA. On one chromosome, you, uh, you have uh, only few relics of the RDNA, and on the other part, you have, you have about 73 copies of the uh, RDNA. So you are also at the hemizygote state. So this means that you have some selection in order to discard one part of the element. It was the same for the mitochondrial DNA. It's from one parent and the other parent. Here is the same. And this is very important, for example, at the time of the cell will be able to produce spore. You can produce spore, but are these spores germinating or not? If you have no germination, even if you have sexual reproduction, you have no more uh, pursue because you are not able to multiply. So in conclusion, we have discovered that this species is coming from three, four hundred years ago, from a fusion between this parent and this parent. This parent was identified. I can say it is not the exact parent because it has some evolution, but very close to this parent is a CBS2001. Uh, this parent don't give any contribution for the uh, utilization of maltose. All the genes were coming from this one. The, but the gene for uh, very well conserved function were very often at the heterozygote state. I don't want, I have no time to discuss this point. This is important. And uh, if you have, but I would like to say one thing. If you have in the hybrid one a gene, that one pair of genes with high heterozygosy, it could be, uh, you have a heterozygote state, it could be an interaction between two different alleles to give a better selective pressure. This means heterosis. Heterosis is not very well discussed in yeast or fungi, but it's very well discussed in plant. And we have to examine the gene numbers that are uh, at the heterozygote state coming from one parent and the other parent, how they can improve the viability of the cell. But it is another story that could be discussed, but it is more a long time. So you have mitochondrial insertion in both here uh, limited number, you, uh, huge number, you have also gene loss as usual, you have the different step in the processes of homozygotization. And one important <laughs> thing is that the localization, the reciprocal action between two uh, chromosomes, and the, uh, no, uh, sorry, the reciprocal translocation take care in one parent, but the reciprocal action between chromosomes C and D, I have explained uh, previously, happen in the hybrid. When you have loss of oterozygosy, so this means that it is one chromosome that will be the next generation with the elimination of the other chromosome, the exchange takes place in not outside the gene, but within gene. So you have no special duplicated sequence, no uh, tandem, gene repeat, etc. The double strand break takes place anywhere in the uh, evolution of the uh, genome. What is important is a very well-conserved synteny. 
I explained we have published them a few years ago, but it is still an important point. Conservation of chromosomal map are very important for genome evolution. And uh, what is happening all the time is point mutation or micro deletion or micro insertion. So, prominent role of LOH, unequal contribution of the parent. This one was uh, minor by uh, instead of this one. Unilateral loss of RDNA. So, this is finished for this story. And now, because uh, we have to do other things, we are running a program. And until now, we were working on Saccharomyces cetacea, in the Saccharomyces cotina. We are doing a huge comparison of yeast, including basidiomycet from this group, this group. We are sequencing 36 new species, encompassing all the basidiomycotina and the ascomycotina. And the idea is to see what is conserved and not conserved. And the second idea is yeast are, I say in guinea, in bracket, immortal cell. So they are dividing like single cell. So what could be interesting is to see if we have the genomic signature of the event coming from fungi that are doing filamentous with many cells, and what is the jump between this one to go to yeast? Yeast go to immortality, but also if I go far, 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 far away, it's a way to understand the processes of cancerization because cancerization is you have a tissue and one time one cell escape and start to grow independently. But as you know, it's just uh, to discuss. Now, I would like to say thank you for your interest. If if you have some interest, never forget to go to this website because you have all the information. And in this case, you have all the data, even for the sequence of this allele, this allele, with the difference in the uh, point mutation, and so on, and so on. So thank you for your interest. And if you have any question, uh, feel free to ask me. Thank you. Thank you.